Hi, I'm Dr. James Doughton, Professor of Business at Middlesex Community College at the Lowell City Campus in Lowell, Massachusetts. Today we will have uh, the great opportunity to view student scholars research work. Why don't we take this time to um, sit back and relax and see what they have presented from a term of research that they have gathered. Thank you. I'm Zachary Wett and this is Technology in the Brain. So, computers in the brain, they're really similar. How does, how does similar? They use uh, electronic impulses to communicate. So the way computers work is um, you have um, networks and you have uh, little things that send impulses and they're either on or off, like they use ones and zeros to communicate um, and they can use this to mean different things, they can get a bunch of different numbers through it. And um, so pretty much all you really need to know is that computers, when they're sending impulses, they're either on or off. Same thing with neurons in the brain. They're either sending impulses or they're not. There's no middle ground. The only difference though is that um, they can send inhibitors, they send chemicals. So you have um, the neurons branch out and they touch, almost touch each other and they have um, at the end they have like a little area and in between that's where the chemicals are being sent. So you can have a bunch of different chemicals and that's the biggest difference is that while they can be sending impulses or not, they can be sending different types of impulses. So that's why it's really hard to like, you know, compare them, but they are really similar. You can still kind of do the one zero one thing with them. Um, and we can interpret impulses. We have the technology now, they're called electrodes. Um, there's a lot of intrusive and non-intrusive, we'll get into that later. Um, but you can read the brain with that, so it's pretty cool. Um, and through research, um, we've actually have areas of the brain. You can see it here. This is just kind of a little overview. You probably can't read the different areas. It doesn't matter. It's not a big deal. Um, but I mean, like you can see here, we have the visual center of the back, and that little small brain is called this um, cerebellum, and that's uh, it's really primitive. That's like fine motor skills and stuff like that. But I'm not going to get too into it. That's like medical. Um, so CAT scans, also known as MRIs or fMRIs, um, functional magnetic res uh, resonance imaging. Um, it, uses, it utilizes blood flow. So pretty much what happens is when your brain is active, certain regions receive more blood because blood carries nutrients and they need nutrients to actually be active and to stay alive. So what they do is, um, in, like the early, in the late 1800s, about 1840, uh, 1890, they, they uh, discovered that um, there was, you know, they discovered that correlation that there's more blood flow with more activity, but they also discovered that um, the way they get the static images, um, the brain will repel oxygen-rich blood, like parts of it, and attract oxygen-depleted blood. Um, and that's kind of how they get the static image of that. So it's really useful because, um, I mean, what they'll do is you can be conscious for this, it's not intrusive, um, just be permission to go into like big machine and the, uh, the doctors will talk to you and they'll have it running, they'll just see what parts of the brain are active. So it'll be like, think of the color blue and you'll have like two different parts of the brain active. You'll be thinking of, uh, like for instance, if you thought about the color blue, you would have like parts of the brain for like thinking of the words, so, like actually vis visualizing the word. And then your, um, the visual aspect of the color blue would be active too. So you have two different parts and they can determine that. And that's kind of how they got the layout of the brain for what different regions. Um, that really helps um, doctors for surgery because they know where they have to go um, when they're doing that, you know, like where they have to take parts of the brain and if they do have to do surgery. Um, psychologists helps them a lot too um, with their studies and like how to use medicine to deal with like depression and stuff like that. EEGs is another method. Um, this one actually reads the electronic impulses of the brain. The way it does that is it measures the uh, electronic currents, the, I the ion currents, which ions is electricity. Electricity is physically ions moving out of something. Um, so they're, they're reading that. There's intrusive and non-intrusive methods. And the, uh, the non-intrusive method would be this, um, a cap on the skull. You don't have to do any surgery. Um, the, the first way they did this was um, with mice. They would uh, cut open the skull, have the brain exposed, and they would put the electrode on the actual brain to measure it. The problem, it's not a problem, but just something about that is um, they can't, you can't read single neurons firing, they're too small, it's, it's just not enough. Um, so what they do is they get patterns of neurons. So, I mean, like, as technology goes on, we're going to get closer and closer to singling out the neurons. It's going to be pretty cool in the future. Um, 
So yeah, this can be really cool because um, what you can do with this is you can send these impulses to a computer and the computer can um, interpret it and decode what's going on. So uh, for instance, they, they're able to measure vowel sounds. Um, it's, it's a ballpark right now, it's very early, um, but they, what they can do is they're measuring vowel sounds and uh, so they'll be like, think they'll have a couple of vowels like EIO and like think of one of them and they'll be like an on-screen cursor and move towards what they're thinking. It takes just like anything, like uh, baseball, it takes practice, you know. Um, so the research, like how is this helpful to like the research community? Well, EEGs, um, so because it can interpret the actual impulses, we can relate this to computers um, and we can decode this. We, we use math a lot, it's very mathematical. Um, and it gives you an accurate reading of activity rather than the CAT scan, which is kind of a um, roundabout way of getting to that. Um, the CAT scan, like I said, uses blood flow and it shows reaches of the brain that are active rather than impulses. Um, and you get a static image, and that one you would have to use a computer program to get an image. So, yeah, so what? Uh, well, like I said, we can use this to, you know, better surgery, definitely 100%. Uh, we know what areas of the brain that we need to go into. Um, but we can do prosthetic limbs. That's one of the coolest things, I think, honestly. Um, you know, you can have a soldier come back that has his arm blown off and put one of those caps on, or like you can go into the brain and put an electrode in the brain, and uh, you can move the arm just by thinking about it. It's still really early. Um, I mean, we I, we already have some successful ones, but it's still early, you know, it's uh, still developing. Um, and yeah, I mean, we're always trying to learn more about the brain. It's still really unknown. A lot of it's just theory. Um, and that's just kind of it, the idea of what's happening. You have an electrode in the brain or the cap. Um, it's, it's getting the impulses. It's setting into some kind of computer program that um, the way they did it was with monkeys. Um, so they were using the intrusive method, so they, had, they put the electrode in the brain, and because of the brain's plasticity, that means that it can grow and uh, form, um, adapt pretty much. It uh, would grow over and become part of the electrode, so like, the electrode becomes part of the brain, and then uh, that is what sends the computer program, or that's what sends the impulse to the computer program. Um, and what they did was, they studied the, the monkeys first, like they were moving physically, like pick this up and put it over here, press this button, and then what they did was, um, they would have them think, they would have them put on the EEG cap, and then they would have them do it again, and they would measure, like, mathematically, they would create a formula for, like, the, this partial space. It's really, it's really in-depth, like, crazy math, crazy computers, like, like, I don't even understand. Um, so, yeah, prosthetic limbs, they use, that's going to be the EEGs. Um, like I said, you have the intrusive the caps, the non-intrusive caps, and the intrusive electrodes, and you use the math and computers to do that. And we're getting closer to like kind of an Iron Man. It's kind of weird. It's crazy. Um, that's kind of what right there. We could potentially be making these army people with suits. We don't have to send real soldiers. We could just have like robots controlled by like an avatar, sort of like the movie. It's it's nuts. The future is going to be crazy. Uh, mind reading. So, like I said, we can get vowel sounds right now. It's still really early. It's still only ballpark. But I mean, like the fact that eventually you'll be able to like um, the the military is currently trying to develop caps with helmets that um they'll send it in text rather than have a screen. So that rather than having to do sign language, they can just like, um, just think about something, they'll send it to their teammate, and it'll be like a guy around the corner, like a look, look out, something like that. It's nuts. So why should the research continue? Well, because, you know, we have these people in need, they're paralyzed. Um, people like Stephen, uh, Stephen Hawking, you know, he's paralyzed, he could really benefit from this. He'd be able to talk to his family, his friends, without having to like move his eye, it'd be a lot easier for him. He can move his body if you know we replaced his prosthetic limbs or something like that. So I mean, it's really it's really for a good cause to help the people. I think. That's it.